So there's a captain of a ship who showed no fear when facing his enemies. One day, he's sailing the seven seas, and his lookout spotted a pirate ship approaching, and the crew became frantic. The captain yelled, quick, bring me my red shirt. The first mate quickly retrieved the captain's red shirt, and while wearing the brightly colored garment, the captain led his crew into battle and defeated the other pirates. That evening, all the men sat around on the deck, recounting the triumph of earlier that day. One of them asked the captain, Sir, why did you call for your red shirt before the battle? The captain replied, If I were to be wounded in the attack, that shirt would not show my blood, then you men would continue to fight unafraid. All of the men sat and marveled at the courage of their captain. As dawn came the next morning, the lookout spotted not one, not two, but ten enemy pirate ships approaching. The crew start, stared in silence at the captain and waited for his orders. One of the crew finally said, Captain, do you want me to grab your red shirt? The captain, staring out upon the approaching pirate ship, said, No, not this time. This time I'm going to need my brown pants. <laughs> Oh, you know, there's your joke of the week. You know, i got to clap for that one. You know, I've got the first service now to test my joke, and if I feel like nobody laughs, I'll just, I'll just cancel it for the second service. I'll just say, we don't have a joke today, sorry. But I know that'll never happen because none of my jokes are bad. All right. You know, there's some times in life that they are red shirt moments, but there are other times in life that, you know, I'm sure there's a sermon in there somewhere, but anyway. <laughs> oh, praise God. Well, we are at the end uh, we're at the end of our Vision uh, 2040 series. We're actually going to wrap this up next week. We've got this week and next week. And we're using the acronym of FAITH to lay this out, F-A-I-T-H. And over the last several weeks, we talked about feeding and clothing, the hurting. We talked about answering the cry of our city, going after kids and youth, their buses, filling this building for the glory of God. We talked about investing in the kingdom we talked about training leaders, and last week we talked about healing the broken, which is by planning a dream center uh, to battle the biggest problems our city is facing. And I gave you the word that we finally have approval for that, so we see that, that God is how God is moving. And today's the day that we, if you think back to the letter I, that I've been you, challenging you that we're bringing in our pledges for our very first kingdom builders offering. And I know that you have been praying about it. I know you've been seeking God for the amount to give to this. It's an offering commitment over the next 12 months above the tithe uh, for the year 2025. Remember, this isn't your tithe. That's the first part we have to get right in our life. So, so maybe that's where you start and you can't do kingdom builders quite yet. And that's completely, that's completely okay. Um, but today after service, we're going to have our ushers, in, and let, some of you might have already turned them in in the offering, but if you have not, we're going to have our ushers at the back doors so with the, well, they, they will collect those so you can drop those off today as you leave. And if you did not get one of those yet and you still want to give to Kingdom Builders, you can always turn it in at a later time as well. Well, today I want to talk to you about something that's very important. You see, it's, it's fun to talk about vision. These last few weeks, for me at least, have been, have been fun. They're exciting to talk about it, to dream, and to think big. But after that is where the, where the work starts. And the, the work isn't always fun. It can be sometimes daunting. You can have disappointments. You can have setbacks. And we talked about that in week one of this series. You see, the enemy's not going to simply sit back and, and let us reclaim this city for the glory of God without a fight. He's, he's, gonna, he's going to fight us. And one of the biggest ways that he does this is he causes dissension among the people within the church. And I've spoken on that as well throughout the years uh, more than once. I've had to address that specifically. But if you read the Bible, you'll notice that the church usually would thrive and, and prosper when there was outside persecution. Churches are usually not destroyed from the outside, Churches are usually destroyed from the inside. They're destroyed when the people start bickering and fighting over their position, over their place, over their own wants and desires. They're destroyed from within. Every church split that has happened has happened from the people fighting from within. And so we need to guard ourselves against this as this will stop us 
from seeing true revival come to this city. Everything that we're seeing right now could come to a screeching halt if we don't get this right. Now, some people see revival. When we say the word revival, some people have a different, different definition of revival than I do because some people see revival as people running and shouting all over the place, swinging from the chandeliers for in the church and, and, and doing all kinds of that kind of thing. And, and for me, I see revival a little bit differently. Last week when I mentioned the crime rate in Los Angeles dropped in that area by more than 70% from the work of the Dream Center, to me, that is revival. Revival is when God begins to change hearts on such a mass scale that the entire city begins to change. So how do we keep dissension from moving in? Well, we keep focused on where we're going. We keep our eyes on Christ, and when our eyes are on Christ, we're focused on the direction that He is taking us. And when, it, when we do that, we take our eyes off of ourself, off of our own wants, off of our own preferences, and we keep our eyes on Him, the author and finisher of our faith. But this is easier said than done. You see, most people find it extremely difficult to stay focused along the journey. And along the journey, sometimes we can start to let this creep in and and maybe out of boredom or whatever it is, we start gossiping and bickering and backbiting others, and it starts really slow, and then it starts to spread like yeast in a bread. So how do we stay focused? We're going to go to the Old Testament. If you have your Bible, please turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1. This is a rather popular passage of the Old Testament. Some of you might have this memorized. Uh, if, you do have, if you don't have your Bible, it's going to be up on the screen so you can follow along. All of today's notes can be found in the YouVersion Bible app if you are utilizing that. All right, here we go. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1. We're going to read through verse 16. So we're going to read several verses here this morning to get started. It says, When Solomon finished praying, fire flashed down from heaven and burned up the burnt offerings and sacrifices, and the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glorious presence of the Lord filled it. When all the people of Israel saw the fire coming down and the glorious presence of the Lord filling the temple, they fell face down on the ground and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, He is good. His faithful love endures forever. The presence of the Lord is in this place. You could see that. I want you to take note of that because we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna watch what happens later on in this message. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices to the Lord. King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 cattle, 120,000 sheep and goats. And so the king and all the people dedicated the temple of God. The priests took their assigned positions, and so did the Levites who were singing, as faithful love endures forever. They accompanied the singing with music from the instruments King David had made for praising the Lord. Across from the Levites, the priests blew the trumpets while all Israel stood Solomon then consecrated the central area of the courtyard in front of the Lord's temple. He offered burnt offerings and the fat of peace offerings there because, of the, because the bronze altar he had built could not hold all of the burnt offerings, grain offerings, and sacrificial fat. For the next seven days, Solomon and all Israel celebrated the festival of shelters. A large congregation had gathered from as far away as Lebo, Lebo Hamath in the north and the brook of Egypt in the south. On the eighth day, they had a closing ceremony, for they had celebrated the dedication of the altar for seven days and the festival of shelters for seven days. Then at the end of celebration, Solomon sent the people home. They were all joyful and glad because the Lord had been so good to David and to Solomon and the people of Israel. So Solomon finished the temple of the Lord as well as the royal palace. He completed everything he had planned to do in the construction of the temple and the palace. Now verse 12 then one night the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this temple as the place for making sacrifices. At times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls. I might command the grasshoppers to devour your crops. I might send plagues among, among you. Now verse 14. Then, so when that happens, then... If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face 
and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, I will restore their land. And my eyes will be opened and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. For I have chosen this temple and set it apart to be holy, a place where my name will be honored forever. I will always watch over it, for it is dear to my heart. I'm calling this message this morning, True Revival. Father, for the next few moments, I ask that you would give me the mind of Christ. God, that you would give me your anointing to present this great truth from your word. God, and as I present it, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would go before me, that you would touch the hearts and the lives of your people. God, that this just wouldn't be some other message that we're hearing, God, but this would be a message that, that deep down, God, we, we receive it and it changes us. Because, God, your word will never return void. It will accomplish that, what it was sent to accomplish. And so we thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's break this down just a bit. King Solomon just finished construction of the temple. The people gather to dedicate it to God. As Solomon prays the prayer of dedication, the presence of God comes in and completely fills the temple. When the people see this, they fall face down and they begin to worship. They begin to bring their sacrifices and their offerings before God. A sacrifice is something that costs us something. King Solomon's is quite unusual. 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. Excuse me, if we would translate that to, to money, that is a very large offering. So we see two things happening here. We see prayer and sacrifice. This goes on for several days, and on the last day, they have a closing ceremony. He sends the people home. After the celebration, God appears to Solomon one night and says, I've heard your prayer, and I have chosen chosen this temple as the place for making sacrifices. There's those two words again, prayer and sacrifice. And that brings us again to verse 13. We're going to read that again. At times, I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls. Command the grasshoppers to devour your crops, send plagues among you. Then, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sins and restore their land. You see, the reason that God would send this stuff on there, it seems kind of harsh, it's because the people have turned from him. So he's trying to get their attention. Verse 15, my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. For I have chosen this temple, set it apart to be holy, a place where my name will be honored forever. I'll always watch over it. It's dear to my heart. Now, when God speaks this, he's speaking to Solomon. He's given instructions to the nation of Israel, which he calls his people. Some people will argue that that God was speaking to the nation of Israel at this time, so this passage is not applicable to us today. They'll say this passage does not apply to us. They'll say it's used out of context when we try to apply this to, to our life today. And personally, I don't believe that to be true, and there's, there's a reason for that. I believe God here gives us a formula for revival that not only applies to us as a nation, but it also applies to our city, it applies to our church, but it applies to us as individuals as well. A personal revival, so to speak. If you feel like your relationship with God is just kind of dead, I'm going to give you the the tool to revive it. I'm going to show you what you need to do this morning to revive your relationship with God. And then when you get revived and you have that personal revival, that fire will spread to other people and it's very contagious. So God is talking about his people. He says, if my people, well, who are his people? God's people are those that are called by his name. This would include every one of us as a Christ follower. This this includes, includes all believers. We are God's people. Paul confirms this in Exodus, or uh, Paul confirms this when he quotes Exodus chapter 6. Look at this. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 16. He's quoting Exodus. And what union can there be when between God's people and, and God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. We are God's people. As God said, and here's what he quotes, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things. Basically, don't do what they are doing and I will welcome you. 
and I will be your father. You'll be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And then Titus chapter 2 and verse 14 says, He, which is Jesus, gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. So these instructions that God lays out in 2 Chronicles, I believe they're still relevant for us today. And he's actually given us a formula to follow. They're conditional promises that he's given us as believers. In other words, he's saying, if you will do this, then I will do this. Remember, he starts that with a conjunction. When, when, the, when the plague comes and the grasshoppers come, then, if you do this, then I will do this. Conditional promises. It are, that means this is conditioned, this, is, this promises is based on our actions. Meaning if I don't do my part, God is not, out, not obligated to do his part. And so many times in life, we want God to do his part, but we're not willing to do our part. And so he instructs us to do four things. Humble ourselves, pray, seek his face, turn from our wicked ways. We could easily write a sermon on all of these, but for the sake of time, we're just going to briefly discuss all four of them. The first thing he says is you must humble yourself. Humble yourselves. We must humble ourselves. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. It says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. How? Thinking of others as better than yourselves. How I many of you know that's hard to do? Don't look out for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. How I many of you know that's hard to do? It's easy to preach this stuff. It's hard to live it. If you've ever raised kids, you probably realize very quickly, all these parents up on the stage a moment ago can probably vouch for this, that you do not have to teach your child the word mine. The word mine just comes naturally. You have to teach them how to say please. You have to teach them how to say thank you. But you don't have to teach them the word mine. Mine comes naturally for all of us. We are very selfish by nature. We're always looking out for us. So here comes Paul in Philippians, and he's teaching us, just like we have to be taught to say please and thank you, he's teaching us what true humility looks like. It doesn't mean we're walking around all negative, putting ourselves down all the time. That's not humility. Humility happens when I get to a place in life where it's not all about me anymore. It's about others. And I can say, you know what, it's okay if I don't get what I want. It's okay if I don't get my way. Because our default is to be selfish. This is something that we have to fight every single day. This is a battle. And this is why he instructs us to humble yourself. We have to take part in this. Next, next he says we must pray. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2. Devote. Take note of the word devote. Yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and thankful heart. Pray for us too that God will give us many opportunities to speak out to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I'm here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Paul says we should devote ourselves to prayer. Now the word devote comes from a Greek word, proskertio, I think is how you say it. It's up there, you can pronounce it, maybe you know how to say it. <laughs> but it means to continue all the time. We're instructed in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17 to pray continually. Now, does that mean we're at the side of our bed praying all day? It's not what that means at all. The way I pray continually is, is I, I, commun I try to communicate with God all throughout the day. I'm driving my car. God, I need, I need wisdom with this. I, I, I don't know what to do. Maybe you, someone pops into my mind, God, would you, would you touch them? They're getting ready to go in for surgery. It, just continually throughout the day. But when we do that, it keeps God on our mind. <clears throat> Next, we are to seek his face. Psalm 105, verse 4, look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. The word face here is translated from the Hebrew word panim, and it simply means presence. God wants us to seek his presence. You see, it's the presence of God that will refresh you. It's the presence of God that will restore you. It's the presence of God that will give you strength for the journey that is ahead. 
Nothing else will do that for you. We need the presence of God. Jesus tells us this in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. This is one of the scriptures here that, that man, it's kind of like a life verse for me. Because this has helped me so much just in my everyday walk with Christ. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Doesn't say go to your buddy. Doesn't say get on social media. He says, come, if you are weary and burdened, come to me, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, my heaviness, my weight, and learn from me, for I am gentle and I'm humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You need rest for your souls? That's where it's found. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So Jesus tells us, are you tired? Come to me. Are you weary? Come to me. The presence of God helps me keep my focus on him and what he wants. The presence of God helps me to focus on his will and not my will. And here's the thing. When I become weary, I'm just speaking for myself here. When I become weary, I would say probably every time, otherwise it's a high percentage, I'm becoming weary and I'm becoming filled with anxiety and I'm becoming burdened because I'm focusing on all of the problems around me. In order to focus on the problems, I have to take my focus off of God. You can't focus on both of them at the same time. You're going to focus on your problems or you're going to focus on God. If my focus stays on God's face, if I stay in God's presence. The problems of life cannot overtake me. I'm telling you, when you get into the presence of God, there are sometimes one of my practices is when life is overwhelming and I've got all this anxiety flooding in, man, you just put on some worship music, sit back and just, cl cl I close my eyes and just focus on God. Because the presence of God, when you have his presence, it brings life into you. So much to the point where you can feel discouraged and defeated. Now all of a sudden you got the presence of God. Now you feel like you can charge hell with a squirt gun. And last, we must turn from our wicked ways. No more being a lukewarm Christian. We got enough lukewarm Christians. We got to be set apart. We turn from sin. A lukewarm Christian is someone that comes to church, man. They know the songs. They listen to the sermons. They fit right into the Sunday morning crowd. But man, then they walk out the doors and they continue to live their life in sin. There's, there's no life change. There's no difference between them and the non-believer except for the fact that they attend the church from time to time. And Jesus warns us about being this type of person in the book of Revelation. You see, if you want to see true change come to Green Bay, this is where it starts. If you want to see true change come to your family, this is where it starts. If you want to tr see true change come to your life, this is where it starts. What if we were a people that walked with humility? What if we were people that prayed for our city, prayed for our families? A people that would seek the face of God. A people that would become set apart for God's work, turning from our sin. I asked the question earlier, how do we stay focused so we don't allow the enemy to work his way in and destroy the work of God? How do we stay focused on the mission so we don't become inward focused? It's right here. And if all of us would just commit to do these four things regularly, our focus will remain on God and what he wants, and it won't be on me and what I want. You see, when I fall into this trap, the trap of focusing on me, <laughs> I do, hate to admit it, but I do, my wants, my desires, I like to step back and ask myself these four questions. Next time you start to focus on yourself, your wants, your desires, this isn't fair to me, step back and take a moment and ask yourself these four questions. Just be honest. Now watch this. Question one, am I walking in humility right now? The answer to that question is usually no. Because if I was, it wouldn't be about me, it would be about others. Just the fact that my wants and desires have risen to the surface is proof that the spirit of pride has crept in, which is the opposite of humility. Question two, am I praying? Am I praying continually? Am I devoted to prayer like the word says? The answer again is probably no, because 
Prayer keeps my focus outward, not inward. Question three, am I seeking God's face? Again, probably no, because if I was seeking his face, I would be seeking his will and I wouldn't be worried about what I want. And question four, am I turning from my wicked ways? Answer to that is probably no, because if we're not doing the other three, then are you seeing this? You see, if every one of us as individuals would simply just hold to these four things, we will never give the enemy a foothold to destroy the work of God. If you would just hold to these four things in your home, husband and wife both commit to these four things, humble ourselves, pray, seek the face of God, and get rid of our wicked ways. If we would just do that as a husband and wife would come together, man, your your marriage would be beautiful. It's right here. And God gives us this promise. He says, now, if you do that, then watch. He says, he will hear from heaven. He will forgive our sins. He will restore our land. He will restore our city. He will restore our family. He will restore our marriage. He says, my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. Every prayer, not some, every one. What a promise. What a promise. His eyes and ears are open to this place. He'll give us favor beyond human understanding. If my people, if my people, if my people. Is this easy to do? No. Because this battles against our flesh. Now after Solomon's death, his son Rehoboam was set to take over as as the next king. This doesn't set well with the people And what happens is it causes a civil war to break out, and it divides the nation of Israel in two. I want you to look at this map. This will kind of give you an idea, to kind of give you a a background and history of, of, um, of how this happened. The northern kingdom was given to a man named Jeroboam, which would keep the name Israel, as you see there in the map. And the southern, much smaller kingdom was given to Solomon's son Rehoboam, which would now be called Judah. This is why when you read the Old Testament, you'll read of kings in both Israel and and Judah, and this can be kind of confusing if you don't understand this part of history. So the kingdom of Israel at this time was divided in half. The great kingdom that Solomon built was starting to crumble. We read in 2 Chronicles chapter 12 that Rehoboam did not follow the ways of God. He ignored the command to be humble, to pray, to seek the face of God, turn from his wicked ways. Look at this. 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 1. But when Rehoboam was firmly established and strong, he abandoned the law of the Lord, and all Israel followed him in this sin. Because they were unfaithful to the Lord, King Shishak of Egypt came and attacked Jerusalem in the fifth year of King Rehoboam's reign. He came with 1,200 chariots, 60,000 horses, and a countless army of foot soldiers, including Libyans, Sukites, and Ethiopians. Shishak conquered Judah's fortified towns and then advanced to attack Jerusalem. The prophet Shemaiah then met with Rehoboam and Judah's leaders and had, who had all fled to Jerusalem because of Shishak. Shemaiah told them, this is what the Lord says, you have abandoned me, so I am abandoning you to Shishak. Then the leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves And said, the Lord is right in doing this to us. When the Lord saw their change of heart, he gave this message to Shemaiah. Since the people have humbled themselves, I will not completely destroy them. And will soon give them some relief. I will not use Shishak to pour out my anger on Jerusalem. But they will become his subjects. So they will know the difference between serving me and serving earthly rulers. Boy, that would preach just with the election coming up right there. So King Shishak of Egypt came up and attacked Jerusalem. He ransacked the treasuries of the Lord's temple and the royal palace. He stole everything, including all the gold shields Solomon had made. So I want you to understand this. The same temple that Solomon had built to God Almighty, the same temple that seen the glory of God fall, that the people fell face down and worshiped the Lord 
is now in ruins. And it was in ruins because the people chose to ignore the commands of God. What God is doing right now in this place could all be in ruins one day if we follow that path. But years later, God raises up a young man to say enough is enough. It's time to take back what the enemy has stolen. It's time to rebuild the foundation. It's time once again to humble ourselves, to pray, seek God's face, turn from our wicked ways. And just a few chapters later, 2 Chronicles chapter 24 and verse 1, it says this, Joash was seven years old when he became king. God sent a seven-year-old and he reigned in Jerusalem 40 years. His mother was Jebiah from Beersheba. Josiah did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight throughout the lifetime of Jehoiada the priest. Jehoiada chose two wives for Joash, and he had sons and daughters. At one point, Joash decided to repair and restore the temple of the Lord. He summoned the priests and the Levites and gave them these instructions. Go to all the towns of Judah and collect the required annual offering so that we can repair the temple of your God. Don't delay. But the Levites did not act immediately. So the king called for Jehoiada, the high priest, and asked him, why have you demanded the Levites go out and collect the temple taxes from the towns of Judah and Jerusalem? Moses, the servant of the Lord, levied this tax on the community of Israel in order to maintain the tabernacle of the covenant. Over the years, the followers of the wicked Athaliah had broken into the temple of God, and they had used all the dedicated things from the temple of the Lord to worship the images of Baal. So the king ordered a chest to be made and set outside the gate leading to the temple of the Lord. Then a proclamation was sent throughout Judah and Jerusalem telling the people to bring the Lord the tax that Moses, a servant of God, had required of the Israelites in the wilderness. And this pleased all the leaders and the people. And they gladly brought their money and filled the chest with it. Whenever the chest became full, the Levites would carry it to the king's officials. Then the court secretary and officer of the high priest would come and empty the chest and take it back to the temple again. This went on day after day and a large amount was collected. The king and Jehoiada gave the money to the construction supervisors who hired masons and carpenters to restore the temple of the Lord. They also hired metal workers who made articles of iron and bronze for the Lord's temple. The men in charge of the renovation worked hard and made steady progress. They restored the temple of God according to its original design and strengthened it. Becca, if you could go ahead and come on up at this time. To repair the temple, this young man, he orders that a chest be made and set outside the gate. We then read that the people would come and they would place their gifts inside the chest and it would be overflowing. They'd empty it, they'd fill fill up again. Now watch this. This is what I want you to see. Because the people were faithful, they were able to complete the work that God had called them to. When everyone did their part, the vision was accomplished. You see, the vision's only going to be accomplished if every one of us decide to do our part to humble ourselves, to pray, to seek God's face, to turn from our wicked ways. We always say, let someone else do that. No, 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 this is, in order for us to to see the vision come to pass, this is a personal commitment of all of us. We all have that spiritual part to play. But we also have a part to play in several weeks ago when I laid out the vision I to invest in the kingdom of God. Our part to play to be a part of the vision by investing into kingdom builders, by being faithful with our tithe. And when we all do that, we can really make advancements towards the vision. And so we have this opportunity before us today, our opportunity for us all to be a part to see the vision come to pass. I want you to think for a moment the impact. I want you to understand the impact that your gift has when you invest into the kingdom of God. Up here I have an apple. And if I cut cut this apple in half, inside of the apple there's going to be apple seeds. We all know that. And we can dig the apple seeds out of the apple. And if I dig this apple apart, the, the seed is very, very small. Probably can't even see it. I can dig all of the apples, all of the seeds out of this apple, and I can say there's eight apples or eight seeds in this apple. But if you take this same seed, you plant it to the ground, a tree will blossom. 
And out of that tree will come thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of apple from this small little seed. And our offerings are like that when we give them to the work of God. It might be small, but when you put it in God's hands, you see, we can count the apples in a, or the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the number of apples that are in the seed. Millions, maybe, who knows? What God can do when we're faithful. And so this is what we're going to do today as we turn in our Kingdom Builders pledges. We're planting in soil that's going to produce fruit for years to come. You've, I laid this vision out, it had been six years ago, and we did a Vision 2040 offering at that time. And look at what God has done in the, in the six years. And I told you during that, during that message, letter I, what more, I, I'd be talking about a new vision if, if more people would have stepped up. It's amazing what we can do when we come together. So I encourage you today to be a part of the vision. Humble yourself, pray, seek God's face, turn from your wicked ways, be faithful with your giving, and be a part of God's plan to change Green Bay. Can I have you close your, close your eyes, bow your heads? God, we just want to thank you today. Thank you for this word, this challenge. God, and I just, I know many people have been praying about this. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you begin to move. God, it's when we all come together and do our part that we can see great advancements towards the vision, mass amount of people saved, lives changed. So God, I just want to thank you for this opportunity that we have to give, that we have to plant seeds. And only you know the fruit that will come from that, God. So we thank you today. I pray that you bless each and every one, Father, as they faithfully commit to this. Bless their family. God, let this word be on our heart as we leave here today. Let this just not be another message. Let it be something that penetrates our soul to remember. I, I need to humble myself and pray and seek God's face and turn from my wicked ways. I want to see revival in my life and in my family, my church. God, we thank you for it today in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to keep your head bowed and your eyes closed.